So Denise, hello and thank you for joining us uh, today. You're joining us from the Seneca Valley School Dis District in the USA. And uh, well, your school offers a multitude of opportunities for students and you have been working with online issues, also including cybersecurity for many years. You have prepared a presentation on sustainability and growth, K-12 online learning. And I would like to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my name is Denise Manganello, and I am located in Pennsylvania. So um, everything that I'll be speaking of is based on uh, the state laws and regulations of Pennsylvania. But um, I did try to make everything pertinent so then you could take that to your school and apply the different pieces. Um, our district has been teaching online K-12 learning for the past 12 years, and we have over um, 12,000 um, students with partnering districts, and then um, just within our own district, we have about 1,500 students taking online courses during the day. Um, the purpose when we created our cyber program was really looking at opportunities for our students and providing a public school in Pennsylvania, we were challenged also with charter schools and um, keeping our students within our district and not having them opt to go to other public charter schools. So by doing that, we looked at what skills students needed to be 21st century learners and be prepared for life. Uh, the other pieces that really um, helped create the cyber program is what the families all wanted with the benefits of um, flexible scheduling. We have a lot of um, families in our district that travel international and um, we have students all over the world taking classes. So um, we also have a lot of students that uh, are hoping to make it in professional hockey and professional dance. So um, big ballet and um, hockey area. But that gives you a quick overview of why we did it, but I think the main pieces and what I'm hoping that you're gain from this presentation is really the how and what are some of the things that we learned when doing this to make sure that your program set up successfully so then you don't hit some of the roadblocks that we hit 13 years ago when we were starting this whole process. So I think the first thing um, that everybody needs to have no matter what program or how you're starting is common language and making sure that that common language is spoken by everyone. So what I did here was I just took a slide to define the words that we use where when we look at a full-time cyber student that is a student that is taking all courses online. They can be on campus taking the course or they can be at home taking the course. Or as I said earlier, we have some students traveling with their parents to work all over the world and staying within our district, but they're taking all of their courses as online learners. The other main area that we have is what we call a hybrid schedule, and that's a part-time student where they have a mixture of traditional and cyber classes during the day. So we are on an eight-period bell schedule, and when the bells ring, some students go into a cyber lab and work independently on a cyber course. Not all those students are taking the same course. They can take any of our 276 courses during that time period. But it then provides more opportunity and flexibility where you're not saying no on a master schedule and everything works for students. We also have, um, career and technical students where they will take half their courses, all their academic courses online, and then they're at the career and technical center for the other half of the day. So that gives them the capability of sometimes even staying at the career technical center all day long working on a project, and then on an opposite day working on their academic classes. Remediation, enrichment, credit recovery, those kind of all fall together with it, but um, definitely once you have a cyber program, how can that tie in for remediation purposes within the traditional class? Because as you create your classes, you can 
you're going to mirror those to what you're offering in the brick and mortar. So by doing that, if you have a student that is absent or sick um, with homebound instruction, you can provide them with that online learning at different pieces. You can also, if a kid's not understanding the material, provide remediation through online learning with it. The same with enrichment or acceleration. We have moved in our district where the grade levels no longer equal when a student takes a course. So if they are enriched or accelerating, especially in math classes, they can take a course earlier than what the building level provides for them. Uh, credit recovery is just keeping kids on track for graduation. Uh, they take a prescriptive exam before they start the course, and then they only work on what they didn't master. So that gives students the opportunity to still stay on track, and it has prevented a lot of students from dropping out of school and um, feeling the success that they could have, even though they made a bad choice or a bad decision during their high school year that kind of made them fall into that credit recovery area. And then the other category that we have is just alternative education situations, um, where we're utilizing our online cyber program for our expulsion kids. So again, if a kid makes a bad choice and can no longer come to campus, we don't have to send them to an alternative ed school with other students that are making bad choices. We now can send them to their home and still provide the higher level of education for them and keep them on track for college or if they're going to a career after and make sure that they're still prepared even though they made a bad choice during their time in high school. Um, again, we look at behavior, attendance issues, um, mental health issues. We've created a couple of therapeutic classrooms where we have um, in-school therapists available, but then the students are taking all their classes online. So then as they're having different pieces of their life that they're trying to figure out with the mental health component, we're trying to connect that mental health and education together, which a lot of times it's never connected. It's mental health on one side, education on the other, and we're not communicating and working together. So we've worked really hard with creating these classrooms to support students so then they can stay on track for graduation even though they're having some mental health issues at that time. Same thing with physical health. If a student's on homebound instruction, they can stay on track for graduation, even though they're in a hospital a good bit of time. Uh, special education and chapter 15 or 504 students with medical accommodations, those students can take online learning also, but you do want to make sure that you have the proper procedures in place that it's the appropriate and least restrictive environment for those students. So every student can fit into online learning. It's which way is the best fit. And those are the pieces that you really want to look at when you're developing um, a cyber program. The different types of cyber programs that are offered, as you probably all are aware, are the synchronous, asynchronous, and blended learning. So synchronous classes are taught live and students log in at a certain time. This requires your district to have certain technology to stream and have the students go live at that exact time. Um, we don't do synchronous classes here at Seneca Valley because we have traditional brick and mortar classes and we haven't had the need. We've offered it multiple times, but because they have that option of a hybrid schedule, we really have never had anyone sign up for our synchronous courses. So we utilize asynchronous, where the courses are created ahead of time, and students then work independently, but still have a deadline for when that course needs to be completed. So that has made big success of, for the students based on their schedule. So our professional hockey players, our dancers, and different students like that, if they can't log on for three of the five school days, they might work all through the weekend and get their hours in, but they're not on that traditional Monday through Friday time frame for going to school. Their time frame's a little bit different because they can log in and work on their courses whenever they choose. Um, a lot of kids also that um, are 
on different medication in the mental health area that aren't sleeping at night, but then fall asleep during the day. They're working all throughout the night so they can still stay on track, even though they're working through different medication changes and whatnot to get on the same timeline as everybody else. Um, when you're looking at the blended learning, I would always advise people to pick a model and utilize a model. We chose to use the Clayton Christensen blended model for our definition purposes. And that's then listed in our um, memorandum of understanding. So then everybody is using that same language where when we talk rotation model, we know that station rotation, lab rotation, flip classroom, and individual rotation. And I don't even think many schools realize that they're doing blended learning when they're doing the flipped classroom, that that truly is a form of blended learning for students. Um, and then we're using the flex model, the a la carte model, and an enriched virtual model, as I spoke about briefly. One of the big pieces, Pennsylvania is a big union state, and I'm not sure how all of you have your contracts or different things throughout the world, but if you are with a contract with your teachers and that they have a lot of say, creating a memorandum of understanding was the most important thing that we accomplished um, before starting our cyber program. So when we wanted this, we sat down with our union representation, representative, sorry, and our administration and really tried to come up with common language again that was appropriate to work for our cyber program. But the biggest piece was that we never added it to the contract because once it's in the contract and negotiations occur, normally it's all only benefits and salary that are discussed every year. But cyber is changing and evolving every day. So really having it as an MOU and being able to update and meet and discuss regularly has really let us sustain our program and grow it throughout the years. Um, and we want to make sure that we understand that even our needs of our students are going to change on a regular basis. So how can we do that? Um, with that, we create a common language. And the biggest piece was calling our cyber period an instructional cyber period. So it counts as a teaching period for our teachers that they're not required to do lesson plans. They don't have students in front of them. They um, have demands that the demand tallies don't drive if a class runs or not. So a, a class could have two students in it and in a traditional brick and mortar class, that class would not run. It would be um, postponed for the following school year until we had enough students. But in online learning, you could have a class run just with two students in it because the teacher is having their instructional cyber period. So we try to keep the number of students the same as what we would in the brick and mortar. So if you keep 25 to 30 students in a traditional setting, that's what we're doing in the online setting as well. But during that time period, they could have 26 different classes going on with one student in every single course, and you could run all of those courses. Um, and that just gives a ton of flexibility and provides a lot of opportunities to offer different courses that you wouldn't normally be allowed to within a master schedule. Um, the other main piece is looking at the contractual day and finding out, are you going to pay your teachers outside of the contract, contractual day or is it going to be part of their um, work day? We do a combination of both in our district and that really is based on the demand tallies of the traditional classes. So if we have a higher year of family consumer science courses that they need to teach all day long, then I will pay that teacher outside of their contractual day a stipend to teach the online students. So having that flexibility, looking at that, um, looking at each student in a monthly. So if you're paying your um, teachers outside of the day, we do it in a monthly average because you'll find out in the K-12 world, students think online learning is the best option and they're trying to avoid something else. But what they fail to realize is that it's really difficult and that it's not meant for everyone. And sometimes you have to let them try it and realize on their own that it's not a good fit. So you have your yo-yos, as I like to call them. They're in today, gone tomorrow. 
because they realize how difficult and how important that face-to-face -face interaction with a teacher is and how much a traditional setting of a teacher can impact their life. Where they have that blank look on the face, a teacher sees that. When they're taking an asynchronous course, nobody's seeing that blank look on their face of not understanding. So sometimes that fit just doesn't work and you don't wanna hold a kid in forever you want to place them in the best educational placement at all times. So kids definitely are in and out on a regular basis for us. Again, when you're looking at that, keeping that language consistent, not to write in the class size, don't treat cyber differently than what you would your traditional classes. And that's the biggest takeaway that I think everybody needs to have is the teachers are still teaching online, just as they are in traditional, it's just in a different manner. So keeping your QPA, keeping everything that you would normally do or your GPA intact, they deserve it because every student's working hard in both traditional and the online setting. So you want to treat it the same also so then other people don't start looking at it as a different piece. Um, Make sure that some districts think that they should allow teachers to double up or double dip and pay them more because they think cyber is harder. It's different and it has its moments where yes, it can be more challenging. But when you look at teaching in general and you look at how much an English teacher may have to grade every night versus a phys ed teacher and they're paid the same, you don't wanna change that for your cyber world with it. Um, and then you want to really look at what vendor you would like maybe to use and provide for them so then you're not creating everything on your own. We utilize the platform Edgenuity, which works in, I, pre I think, pretty much every country because we've had kids throughout. Um, so it's a great plat platform that has canned material but also allows you to customize your material to meet your needs of the district. Um, the teacher of record, as Dr. Maloney indicated in the earlier session, having that title, that is important because the teacher of record is still teaching during the day and is still required to be part of the school, part of everything. So what you want to look at when you're creating the program is do you want it to be your teacher or a vendor's teacher or a partnership between maybe two districts that are close by Maybe in your master's schedule, you have room for an English and social studies, and they have room for a math and science. You could utilize two different schools to help make that work, where then you have teachers within the contractual day working and teaching your students online. The determination to figure out if your teacher should be the teacher of record or if you should utilize a vendor or someone else is really, are you ready? And do you have all the pieces in place to sustain a cyber program. So that MOU that I talked about earlier is the key component if you have contracts and unions that you're working with. And then what type of classes are you gonna offer? Are you only going to offer full-time cyber or are you gonna offer a hybrid program? I definitely encourage not being all or nothing. I think that's when students in the K-12 world fail the most is when we say, okay, you want online classes, but you have to take all of them online. Some students really have strength in English and social studies and written comprehension, but their math computation isn't as strong. So we want them face-to-face -face with a teacher for math computation, if we can, versus taking an online course for their English or their social studies course. So looking at that, making sure that your technology is in place, um, making sure that whatever program that you're utilizing, if you're going with a vendor or creating your own, that you're prepared for all the pieces that come with that technology. And then looking at your demand tally, how are you going to enroll students into your program and do you have enough teachers in place to facilitate the need that you're going to have? Um, if you're going to be running it on, out of your own district, having a district cyber point of contact is essential. Um, I have 56 partnering schools that utilize our cyber program, and the districts that do not take that time to have a cyber point of contact are the people that 
students are struggling and not succeeding because you don't have somebody that is looking over those students, really making sure that they're working and that they're still being paid attention to the same way that a traditional student was. And then lastly, and most importantly, being able to fiscally operate a cyber program. And that's really where you wanna compare what is it gonna cost for you to have your teachers or what would it cost to have a vendor provide the teachers? Because both can weigh in different directions. A lot of people sometimes go the vendor route but are paying a lot more where they have the teacher availability that they could do it in-house in their own school. Some of our strategic movement that we did as a district is um, emphasizing the hybrid options by having our cyber lab. And then you can see the screenshots here are what our program of study is looks like for all of our students. So when they go online to register for classes, they can see is there a cyber option or a traditional or a blended learning model. So they are then picking what type of learning best fits them, which then again gives us that demand tally to make sure that we have enough um, teachers ready to instruct and meet the demands of our students. And then we have honors, we have AP courses, we've created um, gaming courses. We're one of the first um, in Pennsylvania, at least, to offer a um, animation course where it's a full body motion capture animation course. And students are going in and building these games and building videos and then putting on the body suit and recording all of those aspects. And by doing the different things through blended learning really allows that flexibility of the schedule to really open up to create more courses for your students. For our district, we have 258 courses from um, traditional and electives, that's seven through 12. We have 12 AP courses, 12 college and high school courses, and that's where our kids take classes here online, and they receive um, college credit from our community college and from other colleges like the University of Pittsburgh. We have multiple courses going on um, with them that students can take. We have um, 30 plus courses for our K-6. And then again, we look at those opportunities to help all students, those that are on medical homebound, those that have made a bad choice and were expelled from campus to give them opportunity. And really the hybrid option is the one that I love the most because I think it fits best for giving kids all the options. So some kids come to campus late, some leave early, um, some go to the computer lab, some are doing the blended learning. Um, we worked really hard to have all of our courses NCAA approved, so then um, students can still be student athletes and go to college to play sports and meet that NCAA requirement. Acceleration and enrichment, we've grown and flipped our summer school. So instead of focusing on credit recovery and students that aren't doing what they should do all the time, we focus on acceleration and giving students more opportunity and having students that want to add more classes be able to do that. So um, we flipped the summer school. We have, we've also added a fifth and sixth grade math where we've taken our highest of high flyers and blended them and created both years, the fifth and sixth grade math in one year. And by utilizing the computer program, they can take a pretest on each concept, pass it with a 90% threshold, and if they understand that material, they move on. But the students are able to finish both fifth grade and sixth grade math in one year. Uh, we also then, with some of our highest of high flyers, our gifted population normally, like I've had a third grader right now completing fifth grade math. I have a fifth grader taking algebra. So again, brick and mortar walls no longer determine when a course is available for a student, but we do not let them skip any course level. So they have to take third, fourth, fifth, where before students that were gifted were permitted just to skip a grade level. But we found when they got to high school and to college, some of those basic skills were missing. So we have determined at our district that we don't let anybody skip any course at all. 
make sure when you're doing this that you sit down with a team and evaluate your program every year. We've been doing this a really long time, but not one year has been the same. And really having that team discuss, okay, I'd like to try this, I'd like to do that. And um, looking at our curriculum, evaluating vendors. Like I've used Edgenuity for the entire time with it, but I've evaluated and I have a um, reference sheet that I look at and I evaluate at least three online programs every single year to make sure that I'm really having the best choice for our students. Um, I definitely encourage attending conferences, joining online professional groups, and um, working together with other colleagues to educate them what online learning truly is, because a lot of people have this misconception that it, nobody's doing any work and we're all twiddling our thumbs, but really the amount of work that is done is really difficult and it's beneficial for everyone to have a program. We work where the sustainability plan is that definitely looking every five years to have a program. Now, obviously that program's gonna change within that five years because technology can change and whatnot. But still having a plan for the next five years helps to look at our accomplish accomplishments, um, plan for our failures, celebrate our successes, look for the cost so we can budget accordingly, and adding staff members, different pieces like that. Having that five-year planning guide definitely helps with that. And having that network of support. So I just added all my information here. So then you have that. Please reach out if you have additional questions later or anything. Um, definitely here to help. And I'm excited that so many people are excited about the possibilities of having online learning for students in a K-12 world. Great, thank you very much, Denise, uh, joining us from the US. Thank you for this uh, really comprehensive and I would say forward-looking presentation. You really seem to be doing, as you said, uh, lots of work and also lots of groundbreaking work there. Uh, thank you again. I would like to hand it over to Rasmus in Germany, who has been collecting questions. Do you have any for Denise? Yes, I do. Um, so actually, there's some questions. Let me start with a longer one. Uh, I'm teaching at a university in China where there's almost no online teaching or use of digital tools of any kind. Many of my colleagues are convinced that teaching online and creating online courses is much more work than teaching traditionally and takes up too much time. How can I convince them that it's worth the effort? It is a lot of time. I would agree <laughs> that it does take a lot of time to set that up. However, the payout, once you have the course set up, is well worth it because then you're just tweaking. It's kind of, I always tell my teachers when they first come online to be full-time online teachers, that it's coming back to being your first year of instructing. And if we all recall, our first three years of teaching was probably the most difficult. And the same with online. Your first couple years is going to be difficult. And you are going to feel like a new teacher all over again. But by year three, you're going to not have that stress expanding so much more and providing so much more. So I think it's really looking at that opportunity and stressing to your teachers about how much more can come from it. And if it's also a competition, at least here, it's a competition to keep our kids and to keep our universities. Um, so many have gone to online courses because students want that flexibility. They want online learning. They expect more from us because they've been born with devices in their hands. So planning and looking at it even more of sustaining our jobs and being there and giving students what they want and making education so meaningful. And delivery is so much a part of that meaning. Yeah, I think that's an important aspect. Thank you very much. What do they want or how do we actually relate to them or do they relate to us teaching them or to 
to teachers teaching them. Thank you, thank you for this. Do we have another question? We are running a little bit over time there, but I think we can allow one more. Thanks. Here's another question. What determines a student's residence? Um, you discuss people living all over the world. So what determines the residence? Residency in um, Pennsylvania is where your primary house is. So wherever you file your taxes equals your primary residency in the state. So um, if a student lives within our district but travels a lot with their family, as long as their primary residency is listed within our district borders, then they would attend our school. Okay. So here's another question. What would you say are greatest challenges to developing a sustainable plan? Having not having traditional teachers and administrators understand the non-traditional world. Mm -hmm. So really plowing through and having the passion and the desire to create even when you have a lot of negative people saying how bad something is. And um, a lot of it is even looking and how I had celebrate your successes. Some of my successes are even looking of, with my partnering district, I partnered with a nearby district and um, they never had honors or AP courses for their students. And it's a poorer district and to me, that just isn't fair, because why? Why does my district that's a little more affluent have 26 AP courses and they have zero? So celebrating those and sharing them and showing your passion of, I just help these kids maybe break the cycle of poverty in our world by educating them or even looking at a homebound student that is in a hospital going through terrible situations, even if it's just a, a kidney transplant like, or something like that, they would be held back a grade level because their body wasn't working correctly. And by having online learning, those kids can stay on track and graduate with their peers. So I think a lot of times having those stories that connect and the why and making everyone realize that the why still are our students and that's why we all came into education in the first place thank you for this so basically here we're running really into the the frontiers or the boundaries that are community-based in a way no we are reaching over the concepts that have been uh, present in our societies uh, uh, administrative wise education wise uh, um, society wise for decades if not centuries so it is really a brave new world wouldn't you say I, I would definitely agree with that <laughs> I am I am uh, I am uh, very happy and in a way uh, also um, well, honored uh, to have you here today uh, with your noble aim, which echoes uh, Dr. Laura Maloney's to be able to offer to all children or to all people of this world uh, the same options education-wise. I think that's very important what you said there. Thank you. Rasmus, do we have another question? Yes, we do. Um, so here's a two-part question. Um, which of the three models, asynchronous, synchronous, or blended, first, leads to the best learning outcomes, and second, is the most sustainable? So this is a complex question. I think yeah. I would say blended learning is the best because you see the kids face to face on some days and then they're on the computer on other days. But sustainability wise, asynchronous is your easiest and what most students are looking for. Um, so having that flexibility where they don't have to come to campus at all, that they could do all their courses online whenever they feel like it. And that's the main piece of that asynchronous is they're completing their work when they feel like it. 
really still measuring, like we've taken a lot of data over the years, especially with my negative administrators that didn't want cyber and thought that it would lower our test scores and everything that we're evaluated on in Pennsylvania. But really, we found that if a student completed the entire asynchronous course, that their growth was there. That doesn't mean that they're going to be proficient in everything, but they grew. So we moved them from point A to point B, which is the ultimate goal in education. We're not going to solve every problem or change learning disabilities or anything like that. But the asynchronous definitely has proven over the years to move students from that point A to B, point B of learning. Wow, that's really interesting. That's um, interesting and valuable for the future developments of education in general, wouldn't you agree? Reaching out to students that might have been disadvantaged for this or that reason in uh, different surroundings. Yes. Mm -hmm. And would you say this is one of the main uh, advantages also of uh, of uh, this kind of uh, online-based learning? I would. I would say that that's a major piece of online learning and a benefit. Um, the other large benefit that we see in the district is allowing students to have more time in their schedule for um, passionate pieces. So if it's performing art or if it's um, taking uh, tech ed classes and doing more hands-on learning, they can take core courses outside of their day that we require for graduation. And if you have that asynchronous model, they can do it whenever. So it provides that flexibility and opportunity to take more even elective courses during the school day. Because we require our students to take a lot of core educational courses over the electives. Okay, great. So now we've touched upon even on uh, different dimensions and opportunities of online learning, which might be shortening distances and uh, let's say lessening the social and uh, perhaps learning abilities divides among students, uh, which might be uh, among the main advantages, uh, advantages of uh, this kind of learning. Thank you very much, uh, Denise, uh, 